It's wonderful so many of you are here. I think we were meant to have this meeting about two years ago, so it's um, good that we're here. So uh, I'm not going to say much. I'm going to introduce Ursula, who will kick off the meeting with the boot camp sessions, um, which will be quite um, interesting. It will talk about you know, perhaps some of the challenges, perhaps some of the help that's out there, and then give some information about how we develop preclinically. And then we'll move to the main conference tomorrow. Um, one thing I just wanted to say is a big thank you to all of the program committee and also to my co-chair, David Andes, who couldn't be here today. And apologies, I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Shampa Das, and I've been co-chairing this meeting with David Andes. Um, one of the highlights of this meeting is that it is single track and relatively small, and it provides a lot of opportunity for networking. So I would really encourage you all to network as much as possible. It might help us address some of the issues that we've heard here by getting people thinking about these issues together. We have poster sessions coming up over the next two days. We have a networking session tonight and uh, poster sessions on Wednesday and Thursday with a poster presentation on Friday. So I'd really encourage you to go and read the posters and speak to people about the new science that's out there. So I'll now uh, introduce Ursula for the next session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shampar. Uh, we'll start this uh, afternoon with two boot camps. Uh, my name is Ursula Teuretzbacher, and together with my co-chair, Mike Dawson, who is sitting here, will guide you through this first uh, boot camp this afternoon. Um, both boot camps are connected by their focus on drug discovery. Uh, I would like to give you some uh, information uh, also and illustrate why we chose this focus on drug discovery today. Um, together with uh, the University of Uppsala and uh, funded by Wellcome Trust, we did a study on the discovery landscape. Scape. And I'll give you a very brief snapshot of some of the results of this interesting study. So uh, this may not come with much surprise. Um, one field of challenges in drug discovery is insufficient access to expertise and information. Uh, access to research infrastructure and the lack of necessary in-house technologies. Access to information to avoid repeating the same mistakes all over. And you all know we have lost a lot of expertise uh, in two other areas. Reinventing the wheel is very common. Uh, and altogether, we have narrow uh, and defined expertise in the organizations. Uh, these are usually very small companies or small university teams. Um, scientific and technical challenges are most important, and still we have problems to find drugs that are able to cross the gram-negative cell wall. Pre predictive tox models are still lacking in vivo studies are a challenge and rapid emergence of resistance. So to cite one of the researchers in our study, he said, for a long time, the scientific challenges were the main challenges, such as those related to gram-negative bacteria. But now the main challenge is that the economy, the economy is broken. But when we fix the economy, the scientific challenges are still going to be there. So these um, two boot camps now were designed across these uh, two fields. Uh, the first one is about R&D support. What do we need? What are the opportunities? What exists already? 
And the second boot camp is about the scientific challenges. Uh, so uh, some of, of these the topics uh, are also uh, to be found in, in the other program of this uh, conference. So with this very short in introduction, I would like to introduce the first speaker of the first uh, uh, boot camp. It's Chris Dawson. He is professor at the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Warwick in the UK. Uh, he's very well known in the drug discovery community. He has established the Warwick Antimicrobial Interdisciplinary Center and has been involved in a lot of philanthropic funding, uh, fundraising uh, activities, and the National Antibiotic Discovery Charity, Antibiotic Research UK. So very familiar with all the problems that we find in drug discovery. Please, Chris. Lovely. Uh, so I just come on the back of having a, a lovely holiday away where I brought my specs. So apologies if you see me squinting at some things. Okay, we'll see how we go. Lovely. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and thank you, Ursula and Mike, for doing this. I've known both for uh, some time. And I, I hope to give a personal perspective uh, uh, over, my, over my many years in, in academia trying to do uh, fundamental research and drug discovery. And I, I'm, I'm sharing my own experience, so uh, I'll hopefully uh, pass on something that might be valuable and will hopefully resonate. So uh, my first uh, encounter with industry was with Smith Klein Beecham at Brockham Park. Uh, they funded my first PhD student in 1989 and then immediately left for Philadelphia. So I didn't know whether it was me or them or what it was, but there's a bit of an ongoing trend as we go through this program. Uh, but since then, uh, we've had research programs with AstraZeneca, Basilea, Cubist, uh, Entesis, Merck, Novartis, uh, dozens of SMEs, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on, uh, and, and supported by uh, a whole range of uh, different funders. And I'm just going to point this out now, because although it's the first slide, for me, it's the excitement for the future. It's private philanthropy and the 100 million pound donation by INEOS to Oxford I think was a game changer and since then at Warwick we've not seen anything like that but we've had several donations of sizable lumps of money for AMR so I think the philanthropic community are starting to get that they can actually contribute and help to this so I'd just say that right now in case you know any just uh, approach them. So um, the good thing about all of those companies who are uh, who have now exited the field uh, that I've now worked with, more or less, is they, they were large integrated companies where you could go with your, your target, your, your piece of innovation, and they had the full breadth of expertise to help you translate that and work with you uh, along those programs. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, there are a number of examples where that's been enormously valuable. Uh, so the examples I'm going to give you uh, illustrate, uh, first of all, that as academics, we started off as being very arm's length from the discovery program where we, we offered something up to industry and they took that and then progressed it to now where industry are giving us their uh, uh, stalled discovery programs, their stalled chemistry. And so now industry is at arm's length giving us things that as an academic community, we have to wrestle with how do we progress those effectively in what is also a, a broken academic funding environment for discovery. That is, that is very fragmented and also broken. So that is really the kind of the, the take home message of where I started from and, and where we're getting to now. So what's it like as an academic? Well, uh, in a standard university where you're employed as a research and teaching contract, your career uh, depends upon you teaching effectively and delivering uh, research and to do research you need funding, it's generally short term, you need publications, they're generally short term. If you don't have those, you uh, w won't progress in your career or you'll be out of a job. And, and being at a university where we've gone through a number of restructurings, uh, restructuring is predicated on, on these. 
you know, funding and publication uh, and a bit of teaching as well. Uh, so that's the background. So that's actually not just, uh, that's not a threat, it can be a threat, but it's an enabler. It means as academics, if you do that well, you're gonna be around for the long term. I've been at Warwick now 26 years. Uh, you know, it's enabled me to do a whole load of things. So that's, that's, that's the academic research environment. And uh, for those who want to uh, dip into translation, they have to think very carefully what's their motivation. Uh, some want to try and make a lot of money. Uh, and nowadays you ask them very carefully if they're thinking about antimicrobials, whether they've got the right motivation. Uh, and of course they ought to do something else. Uh, but if they want to do it for the common good and impact, I'm all for it. Uh, and there are a whole range of different pathways as an academic. If you, if you do it really well, you get good partners, you get good funding, you can make some really good headway uh, and potentially get to a, a good translational position. That is, I would say, atypical, uh, and more typical is you get a fragmented stop, start, stop, start, or you have a very, very, very long lag, I'm just gonna say contracting, and, and then you make some progress and then it stalls and just withers away and doesn't really get anywhere. And then, and then you have this lovely thing here. Uh, and uh, I, 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 t I, I kind of call these kind of projects my favorite protein and perhaps other inappropriate targets. So it's, as an academic, you've made your career working on your particular target and you write the first line of your grant to the MRC, this will be a great new drug discovery target, no validation. Okay, that, I, I was in the MRC panel for four years, I saw many of those. Uh, and, and you can spend a, a, a lot of time just going round and round in circles. And you know, these are projects either not to be translated or they require knowledgeable advice and input to really make them work. Maybe they would work if you were looking at them another direction. Uh, and, and this knowledgeable advice is even more important now with limited pharma partnering. Uh, I mean, and you know, we're looking at Mike and Ursula here and, and that community of independent you know, advisors, uh, and I can think of several others as well, are really important now in, in the absence of large integrated pharmaceutical companies. They can help point you to the skill sets that you're needing and missing. And you know, they, you know, that community needs supporting and, I, and forgive me for saying, we need the next generation of that community as well to be brought up. Uh, it's really, really important. So what happens if you go for all in translation? It's definitely not for the faint hearted. Uh, maybe if you're in a research institute where actually your career isn't dependent on all of that stuff I've been talking about. Uh, or perhaps if you're a medic, where again, you know, you know, you're somewhat protected and you can go for a translational perspective. But for most academics, if you go for all, all in translation, funding is short term, milestone driven, therefore fragile. Publications that might come out of it might take a very long time. So this bit is not gonna feed into your career progression. And you know, the, the chance of actually getting through and impact again is, is very long term. So all the time you have this kind of research translational balance to manage in your, in your head and, 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 and how to advise the next generation of researchers. This is really important because, you know, all of us are getting older and we need the next generation. So we have to help fix this academic environment and reward and return for those going into translation somehow. Don't know the answer to that. So um, there's a lot of text, I apologize. The, the colored bits are the important bit. So I've just listed a few translational projects from 2009 to 2022. By 2009, I couldn't get promoted anymore. I got no career progression to go. And I think I'd convinced Warwick to keep me, and I, I didn't need to worry about doing something that was slightly high risk. Uh, so we set up a spin out. We uh, had a number of joint ventures where we supplied reagents, particularly around cell wall biosynthesis that were not commercially available. Uh, we partnered with uh, independent organizations where they ran the high throughput screen. They did the chemistry progression. I'm not going to name the organization, but they put about 250,000 pounds of chemistry progression in. We got hits. It was low solubility, no code structure, and we failed twice uh, on, on, on translational funding. And the second one, there was blood all over the carpet. Uh, uh, we just thought, right, that's it. You know, we can't progress that anymore. Uh, but that all failed around not getting, not getting a, a chemical code structure. Uh, we realized that the supply of reagents really enabled uh, academic communities and industry to, to push things forward. 
So we went at that much more significantly and have provided reagents to probably over 100 uh, organizations in industry and academia. And what that also brought in was long-term revenue. So that kept the research technicians who had the know-how to make the reagents going and, and the postdoc as well. We then push on for more academic grants using these reagents, persuading industry that we've got some new targets and some new first-in-class assays we could develop. Uh, we had a very successful collaboration, I will say, with, with AstraZeneca, and I really valued the rigor and management that came with that program. We developed uh, assays down to 1.25 microliter with a fabulous Z prime, screened 200,000 compounds, uh, and then for lots of reasons, lots of stalling after that, for obvious reasons, and we've, we're now trying to push some of these forward. But, you know, Pharma Partners have since exited. We've had a couple of these programs. Both Pharma Partners have exited. Uh, SMEs exited as well. So we're now kind of left holding the baby, so to speak. Uh, as part of our academic program, I will just promote the XCHEM facility at Harwell, where you can do high throughput uh, protein crystallography. There's a system there to enable you to make the proteins, optimize the crystallization. You can, you can run a, a, a 500 chemical fragment screen uh, uh, over, over a few days and analyze the data over a weekend. And by Monday, you've got, uh, the, uh, you've got all of your hits with the co-structure in front of you. It's a very streamlined system designed for biologists. So what Harwell do really well is open up all of that structural biology. Uh, but we've got hits, no funding for that, and we've now got slow academic development and pushing forward uh, publications. Uh, more joint ventures where you might notice we are actually developing the assays, doing the structural biology, doing the microbiology, doing the resistance studies. So we're, we're absorbing more and more and more of the te techniques and technologies we need for development programs, and again, working with great uh, great industry partners who've also been uh, super committed. So strong milestone, uh, strong team, good milestone progression, hits development. In this case, we hit an IP wall and poor gram negative, particularly pseudomonas microbiology. So uh, you know, the usual fare that doesn't sit well if you're a junior academic going to your heading department, well, what have, you, what have you done? And you can say, I've spent an awful lot of time actually doing this, but I don't have any immediate impact. Okay, so going further and further down this line, uh, we're doing uh, more, uh, more contracting work, uh, where we're doing more, more work for other people. Uh, we're setting up uh, uh, international collaborations, where we have uh, international collaborators with different expertise, different platforms, different capabilities and a strong exchange program. So we're trying to bootstrap in this boot camp uh, the academic community and training the next generation. Uh, although there's no direct funding for this, we're just trying to pull things, pull things together. Uh, and it's been really helped by uh, unexpected uh, philanthropy uh, to, who, who recognize the need for the next generation of researchers. And very finally, uh, we've got to a point now where we've got an open access uh, drug discovery collaboration, inter interdisciplinary, international collaborative teams, pharma expert, ex farmer expertise. We've been given stalled compound, uh, li compound libraries, fragments, and hits from industry. And at the moment, we're progressing these as a consortium that's not funded. We've got little pots of money from small grants just to keep, keep things ticking over. So that needs fixing as well. So. So what would ideal support look like? There's a whole load of key enables and blockers that are all rather familiar fare. Something that I would push uh, for academics, get to know your administrators and set up some kind of flexible funding that particularly grants that don't have an end date. You know, so if you write your grant and say uh, two years brackets or until the work is complete, that is the key phrase to have on your research contract because <laughs> If you've got some money left over at the end, you can keep going. And that has been a lifesaver to keep the team together. Just, just those words, until the work is complete. Just note that any junior staff here, really important. Uh, rigorous project management is really important, focus, progression. And we found, particularly with the SMEs that we're working with, helping them with early stage microbiology, where 
people come with us to us chemists in particular with a, gram of, a milligram of compound saying, what can I do with that? So we've been miniaturizing microbiology and biochemistry to try and help that. Uh, this is really important because we find in quite a few companies are coming to us with unsound pilot data where they've, they've gone to perhaps some in-house in testing and there's maybe all sorts of conflicts of interest and they're coming to us with some data saying this works and we go back and say, no, it doesn't work. Uh, this is more about financing and funding. I'm not going to go through it, but you know, the, the more streams of funding that you can interweave into a career, uh, the easier it is to keep going. And I, I've managed to keep a team together for 15 years uh, by, by doing this. So uh, this is the kind of technology platform we've now got assembled across different uh, research groups that we work with. Uh, it, it'll, it'll either start from uh, target-based discovery uh, or it can start from natural product discovery and go in both, and go in both directions. So, so we have these different platforms uh, available. Uh, what we don't have is uh, funding to be able to get projects pushed through these, enabling access to these, to these different platforms. We also need to think very hard about what platforms do we want and how do we make sure they're there for people to use, whichever country that happens to be in. Uh, so we're trying this with our open source antibiotics, which is uh, global discovery. We're trying to enroll more and more uh, groups from around the world. And as part of this, trying to train the next generation in live projects. Finally, uh, I look at this as the academic drug discovery landscape. It's rather barren. Uh, uh, for those of the UK, I might think it's M20 Lorry Park, but it would be lovely if we've got a situation where as an academic community, we could populate this barren landscape with you know, pre early preclinical, well-validated uh, compounds that could then be uh, progressed globally. Don't ask me how that's going to happen, but I'm just saying if we can get to a stage where we have a lot of well-validated preclinical compounds of, of various shapes and forms, uh, alternative or not, that would be brilliant. And, uh, and I think... Very final thing I'd like to say is I'm very carefully using the term antimicrobial and not AMR because I think this is only possible, this whole framework is only possible if we look at these platforms as helping to deliver anti-infectives, not just antibacterials, because a lot of those uh, platforms will work for antivirals, antifungals, antiparasites. So for me, that's the only way that becomes sustainable and it's back to this multi-strand funding system where the platforms are actually funded by different strands of activity. And I think that's where I'd like to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I really liked your last picture because it illustrates the importance of very early drug discovery activities, especially uh, at universities. So um, a few housekeeping comments. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge um, uh, the organizations um, that we are collaborating with, uh, with these workshops. That's uh, Guard P, Carbex, uh, Welcome Trust, GPI AMR, uh, Repair Impact Fund, and AMR Action Fund. I hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, then, please consider that this session here will be recorded. Uh, if you don't agree, then you should be aware it will be recorded. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Um, we are moving to the next speaker. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's Silke Alt um, from the um, uh, German Center for Infection Research Translation. She's project management uh, manager uh, for uh, antibiotic discovery. Um, and she's a founding member of um, INCATE, but she will tell you all what, is, uh, what, what she is doing and also all opportunities uh, for drug discovery. Please, Silke. Yeah, 
Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon to all of you. Happy to be here. And as uh, Ursula already said, I'm affiliated with the German Center for Infection Research. And uh, just to start off my talk, I would like to familiarize you a bit with our organization, how our network works, how in which research topics our researchers work on and how we are connected. So the German Center of Infection Research was established in 2012 with seven partner sites all across Germany. So we have 46 member institutions and associated partners and more than 500 doctors and scientists working in this network. So we, see, we receive national funding um, from, the German, from the German government and is available for the member institutions and the associated partners. Yeah, the member institutions of the German, in, um, German Center of Infection Research are universities, it is, uh, hospitals, non-university institutions, but also competent authorities. Uh, like, for instance, our two national regulatory authorities, the Federal Institute for Vaccines and Biomedicines, the Paul Ehrlich Institute, or the Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices, BFARM. Yeah, the German Center for Infection Research, so I will now only use a shortcut, DZIF addresses the grand challenges in infection research. What are the chronic infections, the immune prevention and therapy, tropical and emerging infections, and of course, AMR. And uh, these grand challenges are addressed from nine thematic translational units what focus on these areas and address the challenges. So these units are infections of the immunocompromised host, HIV, hepatitis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases, emergent infections, and tuberculosis, healthcare-associated infections, gastrointestinal infections, and novel antibiotics addressing the AMR space. So, these units are um, supported from the translational infrastructure. This can be the clinical trial unit, the bioresources and biodata, the academy, and the product development unit where I am working in. So we are very much involved in the project uh, management, but we are also in very close contact to our national regulatory authorities to ease development, to bring easier products to the market. Yeah, and our scientists are rather clustered to the research topics they are working in, to, the, to address the grand challenges rather than the location within Germany. So the German Center for Infection Research is um, always happy to um, collaborate or to keep discussions with interested people also from outside um, in the early translational space. Yeah, so let's have a look to our current AMR funding landscape and the gap what needs to be covered. So you have on the, uh, yeah, I have to say this example fits more to a therapeutic development. Um, rather than uh, diagnostic. Um, so what you see on the left-hand side um, is the basic research and normally is well covered from academic research funding or network calls from JBA IMR. And this is normally the hit identification phase and the hit confirmation phase. So on the right-hand side, you have the Bush funding organizations starting with CARPEX, what steps in earliest, from the late hit to lead stage until phase one. A similar funding profile has the Novo Repair Fund, starting from the lead optimization phase to phase one. Then GAT B and IMI um, funds from preclinical pre development onwards, 
And since one and a half years ago, more or less, we have the AMR Action Fund funding the clinical phases. So we have two problems, because when we look at the left-hand side, we have said the research funding is normally very well supported um, by public funding, but it is insufficient for translation into startups and pharma collaborations. On the other hand, so you have the late stage investors and they need more validation, so they need more that you de-risk your project to secure your IP, and you need already a capable team to drive this venture forward. Yeah, what stays in the middle is the translational gap in the early translational development phase, normally between hit validation and the hit to lead generation. Yeah, so we have a lack of novel anti-infectives reaching the market. We have the problem to have an attrition of talent that researchers move to other research areas. We urgently need to survive the antibiotic pipeline because you have to be in mind that later stage existing funding organization like Carpex or later the AMR Action Fund can't fund any, can't bring any therapeutic to the market if we don't have an early pipeline with innovative projects. Yeah, we, need, we know that there is a lot of innovation in the basic research, but we need to push them into the translational phase. And we need to start to combine the modalities. Yeah, DZIF is, as I said, very active in this earlier translational phase, and therefore we are also very happy to be part of the CARPEX Global Accelerator Network. So DZIF is one of four organizations world, worldwide that supports the CARPEX in this network. And since 2019, DZIF supports academic groups and companies on the CARPEX pre- and post-award stage with funding from the German government. So our work here on pre-award stage is the active scouting. We look for good quality research project what would fit into the CARPEX portfolio, and we support these companies during the four-step application process. And on post-award stage, we support scientifically the teams, we support them with regulatory advice, we participate in these meetings, um, we look, for instance, for, for qualified consultants or um, provide them access to biomaterial. Yeah, 39 projects are at the moment um, in the CARPEX portfolio, and we are actively supporting active therapeutics and vaccine projects in the hit to lead and lead optimization phase. And back to 2019, there were four funding rounds, so four application step in each round, and it takes approximately one and a half years from handing in the expression of interest to sign the contract with CARPEX. So it's very challenging, and the success rate is approximately 6%. So if you think about it, that um, very, already very established companies with a capable team and great science have a success rate of 6%. So it's nearly impossible or very challenging for academic groups to reach this funding. And to help these academic groups and young startups a bit more in this early trans transition phase, we founded one year ago INCATE, the incubator for antibacterial therapies in Europe. And INCATE's mission is to accelerate the translation of academic innovation into industrial research and development projects through the formation of startups. So we think that the formation of startups and the spin-off from universities is an important step to get attractive for funders and that you can, um, that you can qualify for a follow-up push funding. 
Yeah, in Kate, we were founded uh, one year ago as a semi-virtual incubator. And the founding institutions are academic institutions. So the, one of them is the German Center for Infection Research, Infect Control from the Leibniz Institute and Hans Noll Institute, and our Swiss partners, the Swiss National Center of Competence in Research Anti-Resist, and the University of Basel. So we are legally hosted at the Innovation Office at the University of Basel. So we are just four people at the moment running in Kate on top of our normal work, but we think we can make an, an impact. And we are growing more and more just from an idea we scribbled down two years ago on a piece of paper to get now a real organization. Yeah, what's INCATE and uh, how do we help? So INCATE helps innovators to bridge the gap from research to become investable companies. And we have three key offers to you. So we offer advice and to align with the market needs and build a quality translational plan. We offer community to share and support in building a business. So for instance, with workshops and entrepreneurs clubs. And we offer non-dilutive funding up to 250,000 to answer critical questions and to reach the next stage of development. So the non-dilutive funding comes from our pharma partners. We have Roche, Böhringer Ingelheim Venture Fund, MSD Deutschland, and Gionogi. And um, we think it is important to involve the pharma industry straight from the beginning because, because you need to align your new technology with the market needs and also with the medical needs. And this non-dilutive funding, what comes from the pharma industry, goes straight to the ventures we select. Yeah, this slide summarizes, again, the member and partner institutions. So we have I introduced you already to the founding members and the industry partners, and unfortunately, in this slide, you miss the important logos. So on the industry side, you should see the logo from Roche, from Böhringer Ingelheim, Shionoki, and MST. And we have luckily a growing number of supporting partners. Um, say support us with in-kind contribution, and they also help us to connect us to a broader community. Yeah, as I already mentioned, so advice and community is open to anybody who is working in the AMR field. Can be also later stage and established companies. But the funding is only open for academic groups with um, the entrepreneur spirit or young startups between 2019 and 2022. And we have two funding stages. So stage one is sought to meet the team, to replace the due diligence, um, and we offer up to 10,000 euros funding, and it is sought to use it for consultancy, really to refine the business case and to develop with the teams a translational plan. And after a successful stage one funding, these companies are, um, are eligible to apply for stage two funding. And stage two funding will then be up to 250,000, and the first application round starts this year winter. So you may think 250,000 is next to nothing in, in the research area, but in the early translational stage, we think it can make an impact in combination with very individual targeted advice that you know where to spend the money wisely to reach the next development stage and to qualify for existing funding initiatives like CAPEX or get attractive for investors. Yeah, so who <clears throat> do we support? And what do we support? So we support the development of treatments, diagnostics, 
and really all interventions what reduce the prevalence and impact of AMR before, during, and after infection. And who do we support? So our target group are academic groups, spin-offs from universities, and young startups. And expression of interests are welcome globally, so we are not fixed to Europe only. Yeah, this slide gives you a quick overview how the application and selection process looks like. So we do outreach, we get in contact with the team, we encourage them to send an expression of interest. So during the last year, we received 62 official applications, but many more expressions of interest. We selected 39 and proposed them to our selection committee. 18 were then invited for a pitch, and so far 12 um, awarded for stage one. And in the table, you can see our current selection committee. We have eight seats, and from these eight seats, four are represented from our pharma partners, Roche, PI, Geologi, and MST. We have one representative from the BIM Alliance, one from the regulatory authority, and one from Gat B to bring the global health and low middle income aspect in. And we still have to be, have one seat left to be nominated in 2022. Um, this is an overview of our first 12 ventures we awarded uh, for stage one from seven different European countries, all target critical and high pathogens of the WHO list, and all are in preparation to spin off from university or are already young startups. So six of them addressing direct acting antibiotics, two of them antivirulence, three of them phages, and we have Petanius is a company what addresses a, a, a quite innovative antisense technology. And just some statistics after one year of INCATE in operation. So two-thirds are really our target group, what is academia and young startups. But we are also approached from already established companies. And they come, for instance, with the ask to present their technology to our selection committee. So most of the modalities is that they are working in direct acting antibiotics, then followed by platform technologies and indirect acting. And regarding the ventures by country, we receive most applications from Switzerland, Germany, and UK, and it is because we do at the moment active scouting there. And to show you a bit our future focus, so regarding modalities, we would like to expand more to phage therapies and diagnostics in the next years. And of course, we also want to expand to other European countries and to be able to do more scouting activities in other countries, we need more manpower in our operational team. So we also will expand in the next couple of months to do more scouting activities and to bring more expertise inside our core team. For instance, for diagnostics, what we are lacking so far. Yeah, and I think we all agree that we urgently need a pipeline of innovative therapies to fight AMR. So please contact us if you need advice, community, or funding to bring your project or startup company to the next level or contact us if you would like to join us to help support innovators. So as an industry partner, as a supporting partner, or also in our management team. So for more information, you can have a look to our current published comment in Nature Refuse Drug Discovery, or you follow us on our website. And with this, I would like to say thank you to the TETSIF team, my colleagues at Carbex and INCATE, to our pharma and supporting partners in INCATE, and of course, special thanks to the ESCMED organization team. And just with a last note, please save the date for the upcoming AMR conference, 
what takes place in Basel from the 15th to 17th of March. And IMCATE will also heavily be involved. And please have a look to the upcoming funding rounds from CARPEX starting from October 17th. So thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Silke. It's an interesting talk. It's great to see uh, IMCATE up and running. And, uh, It'll be fascinating to see over the next few years just what impact you can make on that very difficult space of uh, academics transitioning into uh, you know, drug discovery within, uh, within a company setting. Yeah, I, I really hope it goes on over the next years. So far, a successful start. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so the, uh, the last talk uh, in uh, this, this boot camp before we have the discussion session is uh, from Dr. Philip uh, Gribben. Uh, Philip is from the Fraunhofer Institute of Molecular Biology at Hamburg. Uh, is a member of the EU Open Screen Network, uh, has a long history in uh, biotech and pharma industry, and uh, he's going to talk about screening support and uh, uh, data resources uh, for antibiotic drug discovery. Okay, so yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks for the, the kind invitation and the nice introduction. So I'm going to try to cover two elements today, um, which link to what we're doing at the, the Fraunhofer Institute in Hamburg. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work within the IMI's, or the IHI, now AMR Accelerator community. We're involved in um, creating data resources and data infrastructures and trying to bring a, a fair data working approach to um, the, the different development programs within the, the AMR Accelerator. And then in the second part, I'm going to be covering some of the work that we're doing with the EU Open Screen community, and that's a European research infrastructure which provides access to screening resources and chemical libraries and other tools that can be used to identify novel compounds in the future and going forward. And again, they're also looking for collaborative working. So first of all, maybe I should have done it the other way around, talk about the compounds and generating the data and then the next bit about using the data. But we'll start off with, uh, with the data and the work um, within the AMR accelerator. So looking around the, the room today, I actually recognize quite a few people who are involved in these, this IMI AMR accelerator. And it's, an, a, it's an enormous effort with a, a significant amount of investment by the European Union. Um, it involves nine projects, nearly 100 participants, and it's divided into, um, into areas looking at um, tuberculosis, areas looking at AMR and, um, and antimicrobial resistance, but also areas looking at capability building as well. Um, if we think about the, the overall objective of the project, and this is at a sort of higher level than what we're, that I'll be covering today, it's really about bringing molecules to, and candidates into late stage clinical trials. So they're, they're looking to develop 10 preclinical candidates and five phase two ready assets, as well as a number of phase three ready clinical trials. Oops. And the topics covered are, are grouped by the projects. So it's in the tuberculosis area, you've got um, five different projects. In the gram negatives, you've got two. And capability building, it's, it's combined in ourselves. And what, where this relates to the data side and the informatics side of, of what we want to do is within that capability building piece, we want to be able to look across all of the different projects within the AMR Accelerator and try to define a, a working model, a fair data working model, whereby we maximize the opportunity for reuse of the data that this nearly 500 million euros of investment has um, gone into generating. And I think that's, that's an extremely large challenge given the number of um, individual um, different projects that are involved, different legal entities, different labs within those projects, and trying to bring to bear uh, at least a consistent approach in, in fair data management is, is, is a bit of a challenge there. But we, we'll, you'll see what we've been trying to um, solve this using practical solutions that people can use day to day in their lab rather than abstract concepts. Um, there'll also be a chance um, later on in the second part of the boot camp as well. My colleagues from SSI in Copenhagen are going to be talking about some of the work around standardization of in vivo models and other work within Combine, but I will cover the data side. 
So here's some of the practical tools that we're implementing by the Fraunhofer and also an innovative SME called Grid42 um, within the, the combined project. So I think first of all, why do you need good data management? And I think it, it really sort of comes down to this idea that we can't, can't all operate in a vacuum when we're working in this drug discovery space. There's a lot of flow of information around between different collaborators. In some cases, they're competing groups, and, and there's a churn of membership. There's people coming in, they're writing in their paper lab notebook, and then they get their PhD, and they disappear off to the other side of the world, and you don't actually know what, what's happened there. Um, I think in order to sort of reach this sort of new successful um, outcome of a project, you've got a huge amount of interaction and interplay and transfer of information and data and resources and knowledge and know-how between different laboratories and between different individuals within, within laboratories. So you have to have some way of managing that, and that's what data management essentially is, is all about. And it's about sort of creating value from your data. And what does that mean? And I think this is, this is quite an interesting graph because most of us spend our time in the bottom left-hand corner of this graph. Though it's certainly those who are working more in the early discovery stage where we're running experiments on a day-to-day -day routine basis with the simple objective of proving a set of results that we then go on and we, we, we then make a decision about we're going to advance a compound, we decide to synthesize a slightly different um, molecule, and then we go and test that, and, and it's a excessive round of small, limited objectives. And that means that typically your data resources are always sitting on the left-hand side. So you, you, there's, you have an experimental plan, you've generated some data, you have some kind of processing information, maybe you have an SOP associated with that. But if you want to get to a point where you want that data to be reused by others, even within your lab or within your project, or others within the wider community, then you need to invest a little bit more time and effort in applying, for instance, consistent quality control procedures to the data. So what, what kind of controls are used, what the status of those controls. To annotate the data in such a way that it's interoperable with other data resources, such as the ones that you find in Kemble or PubChem or, and other, other sites. And you've got your original curated data, but you've got derived data which is, um, which is extracted from that. And ultimately, the, the maximum amount of um, value and quality and knowledge is achievable once you reach a point where you, you've got um, identifiers for each of the data, digital object identifiers, it, everything is indexed, it's operated within a shared repository using common standards, it can be accessed by all the people who need to access it. And this doesn't mean that you're putting all of your data out there to every individual, it's being the necessary access to the people who need, who need to see that data. So this is, it's a lot of work in order to do this, and typically we're all spending our time at the bottom left-hand side, but actually the, the ideal scenario, if we want to get to a point where we're reusing our data and using some of these um, sort of, in some ways overhyped, but some of the, the tools around machine learning, the application of artificial intelligence methods, you need access to high quality, dependable um, data resources in order to support model building in those types of applications. So what, what, what does the good data management in um, antimicrobial anti, um, drug resistance and antibiotic drug discovery um, involve? And it's pretty much the same as in other, um, other areas of um, drug discovery and other areas of life science. We're working within this um, FAIR guidelines process, so our objectives are to make the data more findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. Um, and I think that that's something that is, if you now, prepare a grant proposal for your next European Union grant, you'll find that there's a page and a half of it where you have to explain in great detail how the data that you generate within your project will be findable by others afterwards. What are the reuse scenarios that you envisage for those data in order to support those reuse scenarios? What, what standards, what, what different vocabularies, what ontologies do you have to then apply to that data in order for that data to be reused for those purposes? And you have to describe that in detail now. The people who are funding us and, and who we're, we're taking, we're, we're using public resources in, in many cases to achieve our objectives, they want to see that the, the data and information that we're generating has more than just the limited immediate use potential that it has within the projects. So this fair construct is extremely important and will get more important. 
Um, there's also the sort of general areas around GDP, G, GDPR and data protection, security, et cetera, being able to bring in search um, search tools. You have to have reliable infrastructure, um, good access, good visualization, analysis models, et cetera. And that in order to do that, you have to establish an infrastructure. And this is what we, we set out to do within the, um, within the context of Combine, and we, we support the projects across the AMR accelerator. So we've devised, based on the, from the bottom upwards, we've got a set of data standards and quality tools for assessing the fair level of the data and ensuring that it's applying to these standards, particularly around aspects like GDPR. We've got tools that people can use in their day-to-day -day laboratory work. So we've, we've rolled out cloud-based electronic lab notebooks to different project teams, oftentimes to academic groups who've never had exposure to the, those types of um, software before for recording their day-to-day -day experimental work, but within a, a set of um, guidelines and um, principles whereby they're recording all of the appropriate metadata that goes with the data so it can then be uploaded more easily into a centralized data resource, and we have that with the Grid42 system from the, our um, bio, um, biotechnology or in, in, in a biotech um, partner within the project. And then we also have knowledge management via um, secure cloud-based solutions using the own cloud methods. And sitting on top of that are a number of um, resources that we support. And these are public tools that are often used. So everybody's using different analysis methods, um, typically within their um, organization. So we're supporting R and Nine, Python, and Spotfire, et cetera. And I think particularly around the area of um, GDPR, it, I think it's extremely important that people understand what they can and can't do with clinical data as we're moving forward. I think the world will change in the next five to 10 years as the European health data space becomes online and we get, hopefully get to a situation where each of you individuals out there would have control of your own electronic health records and be able to share them on the basis of that, well, how you decide to share them. But at the moment, the, um, the responsibility sits with the people who are, who've got hold of the data at the moment. And these GDPR regulations are what sort of separates the, um, us from something that could be a, a large mistake and um, a very unfortunate consequence. So we try to ensure that those GDPR methods are um, appropriately applied. And the implementation of all these resources happens via the data managers. So within each of the projects, there's data managers, and we, we meet on a regular basis, and we discuss what, the, what their needs are, and also we provide resources for, for storage as well. And we're busy talking to people and training and, and showing them how, how things work and how they should work. And this just gives you an example, um, just a quick illustration. This is just um, a, an application that sits within the, the secure front of our own cloud, whereby we, we're just sharing knowledge resources um, on things like um, data agreements or um, data management plans. So across all the different projects, we can all, all look at each other's data management plans. So we can see how consistency there, and, and, and there's, there's amount of openness, collaboration, and adhering to common objectives when it comes to data management, that, that, keep, that keeps us all um, doing less work and not repeating, the, repeating everything. And we can also look at data templates, and we have um, data dictionaries for different types of in vitro and in vivo and clinical, ex and clinical experiments. So all of those things together, we have our electronic lab notebook. We've got a whole set of templates for, this, for working on a standardized level with data. And they've been very sort of complicated to set up, but we've done that now. We've got our enterprise level infrastructure. We're constantly talking to the, to the individuals in the projects to see what their needs are, and it's all backed up by our own cloud system. And just to show the, the electronic lab notebook, it's a very simple, straightforward, easy to use. Anybody can use it within a project team. You can share your, your experiment as it's going on with other people on other sites. They can look at your data. It's not about tracking people. It's not about reporting to us as the data managers about how well the experiment went. It's about sharing of that information in a way that it can be reused effectively. And licenses for these cost about 250 euros per year, and they're very, very cost effective. Um, this is the, just a, a view of our Grid42 software system. This is something that's actually also being used in a number of pharmaceutical companies. And it's very, um, it's highly functional in that it can deal with both in vitro 
um, data sets from MICs and, and resistivity, resistivity screening, for instance, but it can also do um, extended in vivo studies and work with individual animal level results. And it takes, it's an extremely um, sophisticated and um, highly enabled um, piece of software that I think allows us to do an enormous amount of work. We can also include in here clinical data results as well. So this is something that's uh, extremely useful for us. Um, we're applying consistently ontologies and data standards, so we're aligning to what's happening in Kemble and Kebi and um, PubChem and, and other resources as well. Um, we have seen some limitations in the current ontologies that can be used to actually describe different um, drug discovery experiments. So we want to be able to take all of our protocols and apply um, consistent ways of expressing what happened within those protocols so then people can search through protocols based upon keywords and bring out all of the information and the metadata associated with a particular data set. So we've actually developed, along with the FAIR Plus Consortium, which is an IMI project dealing with FAIR data, we've developed an, an improved, we think, um, ontology for working with um, antibacterial drug discovery data. Um, you, you'll see that in an um, abstract by one of my colleagues, um, Yajana Gadea, um, as opposed to E71, and we'd be happy to answer some questions about that. We're currently having that reviewed by the ontology lookup service, so that hopefully that will be accepted as, as a standardized ontology. And this is because you know, we, we, we're, we're looking at multiple ontologies and ways of expressing how experiments happen, but it's, it's almost impossible, impossible to be able to um, get that in a, con a consistent way to express those, um, those activities. And finally, um, it's not just about um, you know, the organizing people or having data management plans in place. You can actually do something really cool and really interesting. And this is where we're starting to use these tools called knowledge graphs, where if you can um, have semantically interoperable data resources. So for instance, here we've, we've downloaded all of the um, antibacterial um, MIC type data, which is available from Kemble, and we can then um, populate a database with that and navigate around it, and we can click on any of these, these um, well, so are these um, um, nodes here. We can look at the different bacteria. We can look at which assays of bacteria those have been in. We can look at which compounds are active in there. We can look to the original source paper behind that. We can, we can then download the chemical structure, and we can find all sorts of interesting information. And what we can also do, we integrate our own internal data with these data, and that's, that's the strength of it. But in order to do that, our own, our own internal data has to use the same data standards as has been used to generate these data as well. So this is something that we're, we're really excited about and working on, and we're also collaborating with other um, organizations who are creating data resources around this in order to create large data resources. There's a thing here also about sustainability as well. This is a very nice interface. It's called, uh, it's called Neo4j, um, and it's a really nice, easy to use interface. Um, unfortunately, you have to pay $50 a month for each implementation of this, um, and that's relatively expensive, but we also have um, free open source versions of this using um, Python-based visualizations and using site escape as well, which are a little bit clunky and not as nice, but they're, but they're more sustainable over the long term in that, that they can be hosted on public resources and they don't require long-term licenses. So when you're creating these types of data resources, you need to think about how will they be used in the long term, not, not just the immediate use within your project. So um, just to sort of wrap up on the, on the data side of things, we're, we're very much interested in bringing in external data resources, particularly related to um, clinical trials, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Um, we, we've put out a um, request for data. We'd, we'd like people to collaborate and share their clinical data with us um, within, um, within the project. So come and find me or other members of the combined team um, if you have such data. Right, so I'm gonna skip now to um, the generation, the act of generating the data. So this is another um, um, European research infrastructure that I've been involved with for a number of years. I previously was the, the collaborate of EU Open Screen. And this is uh, part of the Euro these um, family of European research infrastructures which look at different topics. So within the structural biology area, you have the um, the research infrastructure instruct. We also have in the translational research, the ATRIS, in the um, the clinical area, you have ECRAN, for instance. But what the, the, the objectives of the um, chemical biology and early drug discovery infrastructure are, are to provide 
access to um, validated centralized infrastructure allowing people to take, bring in their targets, um, and there could be a, a bacterial target related to anti-infector program, and there's, there's a high proportion of the projects related to that, or also to other sort of conventional human health um, diseases and indications and, and targets associated with those. And it's not just about the screening of chemical libraries, the development assay and screening of a chemical library to identify hits. There's also an extensive set of medicinal chemistry um, expertise available within that community, and also um, data experts and informatics experts who can help analyze and interpret the data. And there's also training in, in how it's done. And it's established in 2018. Currently, it's got nine members. and it, from those members, we've now got, um, I think there's an extra um, additional seven sites have come in as well, so we're, we're north of 30 sites now. Um, it's not just a question of that, you, you, you t write in and say, can I please become a, a member of the EU Open Screen um, um, a partner site or as a high, a high capacity screening site? There's actually a, quite a rigorous process to do that the external um, validation and review by international experts to see whether these sites are actually able to provide the services that they say they can. And they have to have a track record in doing that and be able to develop assays, run screens, expand upon hits, etc. And we've got um, three sets of users which we're looking to support. Um, obviously, there's the biologists, so those who are bringing in their targets or bringing in their um, disease-relevant phenotypic assays, and they're, they're, they're a very important but relatively small number of, of users, because um, typically the, the overall capacity of this infrastructure is probably 70 or so screens per year. Um, we've got chemists who, so if you have medicinal chemists out there who've um, synthesized compounds previously, may have published once or twice on those compounds, so the structure has already been revealed, but they want to understand and investigate additional activities of those compounds. They can make their compounds available, and they can submit those compounds to a centralized library. They're then sent around to the 27 different sites, and then they're able to screen there. And then we've also got database users. So the idea is that the data generated within the project in the same way as was with the molecular libraries roadmap initiative some years ago, that data is made, is, um, is made fair, which is a very important point. So it's, it's completely interoperable with other data resources such as Kemble. Um, but then it's also made available to everybody on the original screening, um, the, the compound screening data set. So any data associated with a subsequent optimization of the compound doesn't necessarily have to be made available by these platforms, but data from the, the screening should, is made available. And just in terms of an overview, the, there's, a, um, I think, uh, Quite a lot of what we're trying to do at the moment is, to, is around the training of individuals in the development of automation and high throughput compatible assays. So there's a lot of training around asset development um, and optimization, miniaturization of the assays onto the platforms. Um, there's a lot of technology, a lot of expertise. There's biophysical methods, chemoproteomic methods, high content screening, et cetera, available at different sites, mass spectrometry based screening. And there's some libraries, and I'll, I'll show a poster on that. And then there's also different scales that can be run at from 96 through to, to 1536. And importantly, for this community, there's access to biological safety levels um, between one and three. So you can do some, some more complex assays. And two of the important partners um, who are members of the EU Open Screen Partner Site work, Network are the Helmholtz Centre for Infection Research in Braunschweig, who are a very important partner, and have, they have access to BSL-3 facilities, and also the Fundación Medina um, colleagues in Spain, who can also um, provide uh, access to high biosafety level 3 assays for micro, microbiological screening as well, and have a, a high degree of expertise in this field both, on both of these sites. So this, this may be of more direct interest. Um, in terms of the libraries, um, there's 100,000 compounds, which is the core of the library. Those are commercial compounds that were selected from the 5 million or so um, commercially available, physically available compounds. And um, they've been um, selected on the basis of a few different paradigms, like drug lightness, 
um, activity against particular target classes, et cetera, um, compounds which are maybe not. So rule of five compliance, so the, the, there's a higher degree of diversity within these compounds than you may well find within a, um, a pharmaceutical um, screening library collection. Um, and there's also a, a lot of efforts being put into understanding what interfering compounds might, um, might be in there in order to eliminate those. I think a very important part about this, this library, and this is a key, it's a critical point, is that there was a significant, uh, twice as much money was provided by the people who set, set this up um, to annotate the library as compared to physically buy it. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's 15 assays which will be run within the different partner sites that will allow um, the people using the library to understand what its activities are. So for instance, if you look on the um, ECBD now, you'll see that there's an, an assay just look at the basic compounds, the solubility, the aqueous solubility of all the compounds. So for 100,000 compounds, those, um, those data are available. People can build models around that and use that to predict aqueous solubility. The basic um, effect of the compound on cell viability is a panel of um, of microbes as well, which have been screened against the, um, against the library, all of those data will be made available eventually. Um, we also have a pilot library for smaller scale work, um, around um, 5,000 compounds, which are a mixture of bioactives and um, representative compounds. Um, I think another extremely important point is the academic compound collection. So this is an opportunity for anybody who has compounds within their, within their um, laboratories to submit that to the library. They will, they'll go through a quality control process, check for purity and identity, and then they'll be put into the screening cascade. And then there's an arrangement whereby IP is shared between the chemist who um, provides the compound and the biologist who then screens the compound. And there's an embargo period for allowing to generate IP before data has to then be published. And then finally, in the bottom right, I think it was hearing from um, Christopher earlier on about fragment collections. So this, this fragment collection has been screened um, at Diamond um, during some of their COVID work, and that's also available. It's also been used in a number of NMR-based screens as well for structure-based screening. And again, all of those data will be made available as well. Um, but the biggest multiplying factor that kind of that catalyzes the impact of all of the work that's going on in terms of developing assays or providing compounds is getting access to the data. So if you go onto the ECBD now, you'll see that this is it's a really nice database. All of this. Um, links through to all of the information that's known about the compounds in different public databases. There's predictions about their chemical and physical properties. And then there's a set of bioactivities. At the moment, I think there's about eight or 10 assays in there. There's another 33 assays that are sort of ready to come out, which are in the, in, within their embargo period. So this will be hopefully a fantastic resource um, for this community and for others. And finally, if you want, uh, you can make your um, submissions and there's a, um, a, a transparent process for, for doing that. But there will be a, um, an evaluation of, the, um, of those compounds in terms of um, cell viability. These chemotype to phenotype assays, cell painting assays are extremely useful in doing target deconvolution. There's also those data being generated and will be made public. So that was, um, that was you on the screen. One final thing is just to, again, slightly hop, and I think we heard a little bit this morning about the necessity to bring together regulators, um, health technology assessments, funders, scientists, clinicians, et cetera. Um, we're just part of a new project which started on the 1st of September in the area of drug repurposing. So this is using much smaller collections of drugs, and that, Consort, yeah, Remedy for All contains all of those types of people, including B Farm. I think are also a member of that consortia. Um, I think if anybody's interested in, in that, it's, um, certainly come and talk to us. That's another platform for those who might be interested in doing combinations of existing antibiotics, for instance, and setting up assays to do that. There's a number of pilot projects. One of them is, a, um, is an anti-infectives project as well. And this platform has received I think that there's two platforms being funded received nearly 50 million euros from the commission in order to do this. So there's a significant amount of investment in these platforms and that's just getting started as well. And it's complementary to what's happening in EU Open Screen in that this is about existing compounds rather than EU Open Screen um, is, is about novel compounds and novel chemistry and finding um, new types of hits. So I think that's the um, final acknowledgements, the IMI bit at the end and be happy to answer any questions, thank you.
thank you very much, Phil. I would like to invite uh, the speakers to come up here. So I'm now inviting you uh, to this discussion about support, what is needed, what you have maybe experienced already, where you see gaps, uh, what, what kind of initiative you are missing. Um, all, all these uh, uh, topics are very important because um, these institutions that we rely on right now on drug discovery are usually small uh, institutions, small groups, and they don't have big uh, company teams around them and not all the resources that would be important. So please um, contribute to the discussion and uh, we are waiting for your questions. I've just been uh, asked to remind you that uh, this session is being recorded. Hi, it's Alita Miller from Entesis. Um, thanks for a nice overview of the problems and potential solutions. Um, for the last speaker, Philip, have you talked to Mark about the COAD? How is it different? Is it complementary? It sounds pretty familiar from a very high level. So. Yeah, so we, we, we talked to um, Mark and Johannes as well, and we actually have ingested all of those data, um, the, the publicly available data sets, and I have a meeting with Johannes at five o'clock to get hold of the next data. So we, we've been talking to those guys for a long time, and they, they came to visit us in Hamburg. So it's it's clear. I think, what, um, I think there may be people from the European Joint Program for AMR here, but th th there was a similar sort of knowledge graph based approach that was produced by Underforce a couple of years ago, which I think you know, what didn't have that kind of sustainability enabled from the beginning in there. It was a, it was a very nice tool. Um, I think we're, we're when we're creating these resources, we're constantly looking at ways that we can create a sort of an in-house version, which is extremely slick and easy to use, and a version um, that, is, can, that we can deploy onto a platform like GitHub that, um, where somebody with a, a reasonable amount of technical competence would be able to integrate that with an in-house workflow. They might have an in-house nine workflow of analyzing their data. So I think it is sustainability of those is it's really important. And yes, we're in um, constant discussion with them. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Jian from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. Uh, I would like to thank all the, you know, the speakers for your valuable review about what's going on in antimicrobial studies. Uh, I'm a cancer researcher just jumped into this field about five, six years ago when, you know, our new professor, Dr. My daughter said, you want to do antimicrobial studies? I say, yes, it's okay. Yeah, so I started. And I have seen this, you know, the challenges you mentioned about, about uh, you know, drug resistance, you know, anti antimicrobial resistance for, from the, you know, basically from the scientific view and also from the regula regulatory issues. That's very important in antimicrobial resistance studies or from this field. But uh, I think there's another, uh, it's just my personal opinion, there's another big challenge in the field is the ha house care system and the community awareness. Because let's say this way, you get a drug, from your extensive research, you get the drug approved. The drug is there. Does not mean the drug is in the health care system. It's up to the governing body of the health care system to decide whether the drug is covered or not. So let's say in Canada, the governing body is each individual province. If our province does not want to cover this drug, it's not in the health care system. So that comes to the question is, we have to deal with a group of people called politicians. These are the people making the decision whether this drug should be there or not. So comes to the question is, 
I would like to see, because also I see the fundings, you know, support this type of basic research and set up database. I would like to see that this community could promote healthcare system, health system based research or community based research. So we have to let the people know the importance of this research. And when we come to the, to the governing body, there's only one thing they want to see, not research, not the scientific value, not the drug on the market or not, the dollar value. How much money you can save for the house system, let's say for the province. This year, my house you know, cost, house care cost, is $50 billion. How much you can save if you implement a new thing? If not, why should I do that? If I don't see that dollar value, I will not do that. Another thing is the value for the physicians and the nurses. Most of people ignore this part because normally the doctors are overloaded with their working, you know, Let's say my son is only a third year medical student. He's doing the rotation. His working hours is around 70 hours per week. Okay, so if you implement a new thing, it has to be either done by the physician or the nurse. You have to tell them, let's say, if you give them five extra hours per week to do this thing, they will say, no, we don't want to do that. So I would see studies, you know, say, okay, our research going to... Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What's the specific point you want to raise? The specific you is, we wa I want to see, see, the research is based on the dollar value rather than the scientific value. We can, we can always see the scientific value of this important topic, but after all this research, if I were the governing body, how much money you can save me? Simple question. So, may, Why may should I, I do it? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly. Maybe not. But um, I think you you raised um, this this point of um, value of research. Uh, do we have to consider for? all our research, maybe not just really drug discovery, but also research at universities, um, do we have to see that uh, from the point of uh, value, maybe economic value or so? So that, that would be the, the, the balance between uh, basic research, value of basic research, and then really drug discovery and development uh, activities. I'm not sure if I understood yeah, you correctly. I understand that because the reason I raised this question is mm -hmm. I, I jumped in this field. I see the funding between you know the different, the big difference between cancer research funding and the antimicrobial research. The reason I see the big chunk of funding in the you know in cancer research is because there are many yeah. studies are healthcare system based. Yeah, I think. Um, is, uh, I mean, there is a big difference be between also perception of society between cancer and uh, infectious uh, diseases. So yeah. that, that may be a really, that. that may be a topic for a whole other conference, or at least <laughs> yeah, because uh, another you know, workshop. So I, I, I see what you mean. Um, maybe the whole sector is not valued uh, 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 enough. Thank you. Um, yeah. I think there may be some uh, later symposia that will uh, um, cover a lot more uh, close to market issues. But I just wanted to ask you, Chris, wh whether you feel academics have got the access they need to the understanding of medical needs and what it takes to be a competitive drug in the antibacterial field, you know, beyond just being a good inhibitor of a target. You generally know. Uh, and, and what, what you, do you feel could be done to, to, to address? Uh, I, think, I think there needs to be workshops and boot camps like this for, for, for the coalition of the willing. You won't convince everybody to do this. Not everybody wants to do this. 
everyone wants to work in that kind of go no go environment it can be quite uncomfortable uh, uh, so I think you need to find the coalition of the willing and, and have m more focused training uh, which really is very limited at the moment you probably list on on one hand the opportunities to train people Ryan serves from Revagenics. <clears throat> just one comment and then a question. Um, just to the, the second speaker, really appreciate the summary of opportunities. Um, in the push funding category, you know, NIAD, who's a partner of mine, has been funding translational research through phase one for 20 years. Um, so just important to, they've always been a steady partner there for us. Um, it's really interesting in our field, and I live in the Bay Area, so most of my colleague CEOs are obviously in cell therapy and cancer. Um, there's so much additional resource coming into the field to support keeping the lights on because the marketplace has collapsed and investors don't want to be here. So my question is, how long do we continue to contribute to that without a market solution before we just say it's actually an, uh, unethical to continue? I mean, this is a very well-discussed um, topic. Um, it goes both sides. How do you fill clinical pipelines without discovery? Um, and for this, you, you need push funding, but not just funding, you need also the technical and scientific support. Uh, so that's really the topic of our workshop today. Um, and this is a, a big issue, I think, in the drug discovery uh, community. Uh, so. But of course, uh, you need both sides, otherwise you are stuck. Um, and we, so far, I don't see a, a good solution uh, for that. Uh, what I see is that um, commonly um, uh, people say we have enough push funding because they somehow summarize all the money that's going into basic research, all the national funding, all other initiatives that fund basic research, what is really very, very important, but it's not drug discovery. And if you are just looking at the sector of drug discovery, uh, then it's very little, it's, it's very little uh, money. So what I think is that we, we need to, to differentiate between basic research, very important, and drug discovery uh, activities. Otherwise, uh, you will always hear it's too much uh, push funding and we need more pull. So we need both. <laughs> uh, and Ursula, it's, it's not necessarily the quantity that's in there that's to me, it's, but I, and I'm benefiting from this, so I'm appreciative of that support being there but I know the vast majority of things being supported do not have a viable marketplace when they hit. Someone's gonna wanna have to run a factory and make that drug forever, and there's no way to incentivize that. So I know going in, many things we are doing will not survive if we make it. So how long do we continue to stay in this area where we're just bridging to keep everything alive for the hope we get change? Do we wait 10 more years, 20? I mean, my first lobbying trip for market reform was 2012. And so that's the question I'm curious, like what do people feel like, what if we're 30 years down the road and we're still developing things with no market, do we finally just say we have to stop because it's not a good allocation of resource? And, and thank you all for all the work you did. Again, I'm benefiting with, from it. With, 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 with my perspective, which is one of the, the last slides around an alternative model, which is an open source, and I don't know how you actually get that to market, but how do you get things to market anyway? That, you know, governments eventually pay for things, you know, you need, the, you need the active equity somewhere, you know, and, and that is not just the decision of the UK government, the US government, the European Union, there's the rest of the world that has different needs. So how do you enfold those different needs into a very focused model around uh, kind of uh, UK Netflix model or Pasteur model, that both of which are focused upon the needs for those particular, you know, groups of countries that roll into those. So how do you involve the rest of the world? So for me, how do you do it differently? Uh, with an open source you know, model, accepting that there isn't profit to be made, doesn't mean there's no money to be made, but perhaps there is another way to do it as well. So uh, I, you know, I can't wait 30 years, I'll, I'm dead 30 years. You know, so let's try and do it another way as well, 
Ursula, feel free to kick me off the mic. I just, no one else is standing up, so I'll, I will not stand up again if someone else stands up. That's a challenge. <laughs> um, just remember, I can get something to market for you, no problem. Someone has to want to manufacture it forever. That costs hundreds of millions of dollars, and if you're not selling at least a hundred million and one dollars worth of product, it will go off the market. This is why we lose generics like penicillin, because it's not profitable. That part we can't solve with an open source model, because at the end, someone has to run a factory forever making product, and that's where we're falling down. And so all the funding we're putting in now is just to keep the pipeline there for when we finally make a market and accept either higher prices or larger bulk purchases at lower prices. It's just algebra. And I, my, my main question is how many decades will we continue to put push funding in and do the work waiting for the market before we say, you know what? Yeah. If you're not gonna make a market, we should just put this into cancer research or something else. Uh, well, uh, your, patient, your cancer patients will all die of multidrug infections, number one. Uh, uh, and um, Actually, generics are, are, are finding a problem. So there's, uh, uh, there's licenses that are not being taken up in, third, you know, in developing countries because there's not enough of a market for them to sell. So there's a problem even selling generics. So we need to look at antibiotics as, 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 as medical care infrastructure and not as a drug. Actually, I think if you wanted to fix it completely, it's, it's infrastructure. You need clean wards, you need antibiotics. How do you, 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 just, you just have to pay for them. And, and it goes into the infrastructure, if that's, you know. It's a lot to fix. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the, this, I, I mean, the whole uh, antibiotic field is so complex and has so many issues to address um, that you could feel overwhelmed <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, so um, please, please, other. Uh, questions, or are you all, all satisfied with the situation that we have at the moment? <laughs> Maybe I may just make another another comment about the um, the funding model as well. Is that what, what what I presented there, at least in terms of the second two examples with EU Open Screen and also with Remedy for All? These are platforms that have been set up by investment from governments or the, or the European Union. There is very little money to run projects on those platforms. Yeah? And the, the purpose of the platforms, and there's always a kind of flip side to every story, the dark side of the platforms is that th there's so many people running crappy screens in-house. In and with people who run screens know that 98% of what comes out of the screen is garbage. And if you're not set up to be able to filter out that garbage, then you're just going to be propagating a whole new set of rubbish into, um, you know, and you can make convince a, um, a company to finance it, but it, it'll, it won't last more than a few years. So I think the, the idea of some of these infrastructure elements is to centralize expertise, have people who should know what they're doing work on the projects so that the, the outcomes are better quality. That, that only solves, that might solve a kind of quality and reproducibility issue, which is, you know, a, quite important in, in this area, but it doesn't solve the funding issue, to be honest. I think that's, that, that funding issue remains with these infrastructure investments. So, John Rexy, and I can't resist standing up to, to respond to Ryan. And Ryan's right. There's a real problem. Right now, new antibiotics get created, and that's a great way to go broke and go out of business. Um, we all can't solve each one of us contributes a piece to the solution to that problem. There's a whole bunch of work right now on the value argument. I hope you saw the recent uh, paper that came out about transferable exclusivity in the EU, which is an interesting tool that actually could create, I'm gonna call it a Pasteur-like or a Pasteur uh, dollar amount, Euro amount, a pull incentive in Europe by a single administrative stroke and that would be a cool thing. The part that all of us in this room have is that we need to invent stuff that people really, really, really want. Okay? That's our job here, is not another me too. I will say, I will argue, if you look at the new Carbex uh, funding rounds, Carbex has said, we don't want another IV anti-infective, or rather IV only. It's gotta have oral too. So just you know, take a look at those ideas and think about the notion that it's up to us to spend this push money cleverly 
and invent cool stuff, not just kind of cool, stuff that you look at and say, I really want one of those. That's the job here. And if your project doesn't smell like that, get another project. Talk to Ursula and listen to her bitter advice. Get another project if it doesn't sound cool. So that's my comment for this group. I mean, this is what we can do is take advantage of the money that Silka has and you know, this whole stuff and invent cool stuff. So Ryan, I think this is the year, this is the decade. When is it gonna happen? It has to happen in this decade. The AMR Action Fund is about making new pull, pull models happening in this decade. Uh, you know, all this activity, it's all about, this is the time to happen. If 10 years from now we don't have those models in place, you're right, we all do need to pack up and go home and nobody will be able to get their cancer treated in the future. So let's push on all of those, pull on all those things at the same time. So Dan Zorowski, Walter Reed, I wanted to respond to John's comment right there because when you say what do people want, I think the key is what do physicians want, right? Because they're the ones who are prescribing it. And so if a physician says, I want an oral antibiotic, and that's what Carbex is responding to, that's what it is. That doesn't mean that that's what we all want, right? I think there's a disconnect right now between physicians and necessarily the researcher, not the rest of the researchers, and then maybe the companies as well. There's kind of like this, nobody's talking to each other except for forums like this. Um, and I think we have to keep doing this and, and keep discussing. Uh, but I don't think necessarily we just, we need an oral antibiotic. We need everything. I think we're really naive to think that uh, one drug, monotherapy, is the way to go. It's clear we need combinational therapies, but no one wants to address that, you know, huge elephant in the room either. You know, cancer drugs, viral drugs, we use five drugs at a time. We're not doing that in this space. Only in salvage therapy, when a patient's completely down, now we're going to throw the whole kitchen sink at them. So there's like complete disconnect on a lot of levels with this thing. Uh, may, may I, I say something? <laughs> um, I, I think you touched on also a very important uh, topic and that's the balance between physicians expectations and public health needs. Because if you are asking a group of physicians if they want a certain drug that's maybe usable just for a very few patients, they would always say, yes, we want it. We want as much, as many different approaches as possible. If you then ask them how often would you need it, would you use it, they would say, oh, maybe every second year once or something. So um, I think we, we really need also to look at public health needs. And that not only geographically very restricted areas, but really globally, because I mean, we are, it's really a globalized world and we have the problems not only in US or in, in Africa, we have them everywhere. And especially if you're looking at Europe, I mean, it's so diverse with their needs. So it's a global world, and I think we need to, to look at, at, public, at global health, public health uh, needs and, uh, as a basis for, for decisions. To respond to that real quick. That is a government problem, right? So that is the best solution for like a world global health is probably vaccination, right? Because it's cheap. Like if we vaccinated everybody with escape pathogen, vaccines and took AMR off the board in a sense, but who's gonna pay for that? that? That's government paying for that. There's no way we're gonna have companies do that. So you know, we, just as much as we have to work on the research at the ground level, we have to do political discussions with leaders to, to pay for this stuff too. So mine would be just a comment to this from the perspective of somebody from fundamental research. Um, like what happens to all this that we just find? So that might be not the cool stuff, but kind of cool stuff. And that might be not be the optimal at the current point in time that the calls are out for, but maybe that could be in 20 years what people crave for. So how do we conserve this apart from publishing it um, in a way that it can be reused or resurrected in 10 years time without like a patent ticking off or whatever because 
um, just like if you look for natural products, for instance, you discover what you discover. And it might be a new structure, a new core with certain um, characteristics, but it might not be oral, for instance, or whatever else, it's just missing. So what with all these things? I don't know, that sounds like one from a lorry park, actually. I, I, I don't know how you create the lorry park, but I think that's, that's exactly that's where it needs to go, a curated lorry park. Yeah, I think curated is the key uh, because, I mean, just publications, we have so much. And I, I tried for a while to just keep track a little bit. It's impossible because so much is, is published and uh, just really putting it in the right drawer is difficult enough. So I think it's, this is a key question, yeah. It's kind of always been that way with natural products. You know, when they come to market, it's often 30 years after the, you know, the first discovery of the thing that set the whole thing, whole thing off. So like rapamycin or the number of drugs that that spawned 20, 30 years after its discovery. It's, it doesn't seem fair to the originators, but uh, I'm not sure how, uh, how you avoid that. It's still, it's, it's obviously a massive contribution to science and medicine that the, when those things do come through. Yeah, maybe I can make a comment with the, um, the example of structural biology data and the way that that coming from all these different labs all around the world, but it all gets deposited on, onto the PDB. And it, there's all sorts of different methodologies for generating those structures, but the way they're represented is consistent. So then Google comes along, ingests all of the data, uses advanced AI methods, and then can come up with you know, predictions of structure which are pretty good, they're not perfect, and you could probably still keep your job if you're a structural biologist these days, but maybe not for much longer. And there's a lesson in there about, you know, reuse is about getting your data out there in a, um, in a standardized format so that it can be reused in the future, which is my, what I keep moaning about. But it, that's the, um, <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, what I'm pointing at is not only like the, the re fair reusability of the data, of course, that has to be um, achieved, but the other thing is the IP point. And so it's also not about credit to inventors, that, but, but uh, about like burning something that nobody will touch afterwards because it's not just this particular very right thing at the very point, um, point in time currently. So I think there is also an issue, and I, this graveyard of molecules that could, at later point in time, really be useful if we don't find anything better, um, that should be considered as reusable. Yeah, but there, there's a, I mean, there's a point. In who, because who's the inventor in the future where people are using algorithms of, on public data in order to make predictions about compounds? Is it the people who provide their data? Is it the person who wrote the algorithm? Is it the person who brought those two things together? I think there's a, um, there's a whole lot of discussion which is ongoing at the European Union level about IP and inventorship when it comes to these new, new tools for reanalyzing you know, existing data sets. I think it's, it's as you say, it's, it's a constantly moving situation. So far, it has always, uh, there was always the need to invent a novel chemical entity on the basis of the available natural product to make it better in any way, just in order to get like a new patent on it. And I think like, yes, it could be considered in a, in a field like this, yes, where we are past the forest fire of competition between companies and um, that this is maybe no longer the way to go. Being very patient. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Ed Seawater, Pillar Tech. Um, I wanted to ask about um, really, really, really early funding for things. So we are a very, very small SME in antibiotic drug development. We fund a lot of our own drug development by doing work for other people at extremely low cost, like below the costs of what most people have talked about already today. For instance, somebody paid us for some work recently out of their tax we're talking hundreds, not thousands of pounds for pieces of work. Is there a gap there in the funding that you perceive? Is, is it that these companies are moving out of their academic institutions too early, or is it more that there needs to be some other support before they get to things like Incape, for instance, which are where I see it a bit further along from where we are at the moment? 
having applied for in and been turned down. So he would say you are not um, completely supported with uh, basic research funding money, or you are out of it. Yeah, so you, you, you said you funded it. your yes. company already beforehand, and you cut yourself off from, from yeah, national funding. And now you struggle to get um, follow-up funding. So yeah, it's not necessarily specifically just the pillar tech as well, because we do work for other people in the sector who are in a similar position. And it may be a case of, of like us, a lot of these organizations spun out before they were ready, but there's a few of them around because we are getting work from these people who are coming to someone and say, look, we've tried everywhere else, we have no money, can somebody please do this work so I can generate the data pack to get to the next stage to get on things like in K, like further along like Carvex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what, what yet let you think that you are not ready to apply now for INCATE? So do, are you still in basic research? So you think you don't have the data package together to apply? So because then you really made a startup very early sure. in your career. Yeah. So yeah, so you, you can get in contact. So happy to to de discuss with you about your, what you have, yeah. the technology you have. I, I don't know if it is in small molecules or vaccines or if you if you have a diagnostic. So yeah, th we've got four antibiotic drug discovery programs that are in very very early stages, like HIT, and we're in uh, biochem class A validation of the target. And until we get that little piece of data, we can't get on to the next stage. But to get that bit of data costs money. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the people we're working with who haven't got that bit of data and can't access the next stage of funding because we're getting turned away as well as a lot of these other people because we don't have that little portion of data that we need to get to the next stage. Yeah, but, but um, we call ourselves incubators. So that means we incubate projects. So we, we help with it. So this is a sense of why we, we got together to, to make this, this initiative. So of course we curate and we, we help you with advice. This is open, it's open for you, but we also select who have the chance that our selection committee picks it up and, and actually funds it. Because when we see that, that you still need improvement, we first have to invest time and advice to, to bring you to the stage that you actually can, can apply for funding. But you, um, we are very happy and you are welcome to, to get in contact with us. Are there any early career researchers other than the one I know uh, who, who are either put off completely by my talk or would like some reassurance or any questions? Are, are, are there any here <laughs> under 40? But at least we had one comment from someone who went from cancer to anti-infectives, so that's very, very special, I think. Usually it's, it's the only way around. Because that, this is what's keeping me awake at night, amongst other things. You know, who, who is the next generation of researchers who had one young person stand up and ask a question? But, you know, for me, it's how, how, do, we, how do we fill that as much as how do we fill the pipeline? Uh, and that's urgently, I raised that in O'Neill's second report in 2015. And it's been a long time since then, and there's been, I would say, very little progress. I just want to follow up uh, your comments, Philip. I also came in from a different area of science into antibiotics and um, complications, right? New mechanism of action must be proved before there's an investment. That's, I'm an academic, that'll take about 15 years to be sure, so okay, we'll rule that one out. An interesting point that you made that uh, Carbex now requires oral, RAM negative, and I'll tell you what the challenge is. If I was a, a young person just going into the field saying, I'm going to do this, that's a tall order. Because it actually trickles up to the journals. Uh, you have a fundamental mechanism of action. You're looking at a new molecule. And the question is going to be, well, 
is it addressing the key elements of what people think is the important metrical parameters for new molecules to have? And I think that's, uh, that scares some people, I think, to go into this area. And uh, if you want to go into this area, I think, uh, you know, this is the game. Uh, you go into the disco and you dance until you get tired and you know, <laughs> go home or... Uh, so, but uh, it does not to be negative, but what I'm saying is it does have some trickle-down effect. And it makes the, uh, you know, getting your funding, even from uh, basic science agencies, a little bit more tricky. It gets a little bit more tricky to fund those fundamental papers, which you're just kind of interested as a, as a teaching tool to your students for the next generation. Um, I don't have a solution, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting problem. Thank you. Yeah, that um, I just um, remembered of, of uh, also the funders, especially national funders who are involved in basic research and all that. They also need to be involved in, in being educated. So that it's probably not a good idea um, to, to block somehow basic research, which is really meant to uh, develop a very, very general ideas, because they are the basis then for concrete drug discovery projects. So maybe should that be really separate, more separated than it is now? Because so what I see is that some national funders who are really funding basic research are now uh, requiring really drug discovery. And then I see the, the proposals that, um, <laughs> that uh, tell you really what, what the great discovery they did and what they will do. And I think that's totally not realistic. I agree. I, some of the most difficult things to handle are when you're, you're proposing a basic uh, research program and they require, well, what's your translational plan? And then I think about Ryan over there, and it's like, okay, uh, <laughs> uh, not so simple. But it's, uh, I think it's something that needs to trickle down to the funding agency. Don't judge the basic science on the probability yes. of actually making a lot of money, especially in this field. Ryan, you know, this is where you can think about it. Smart chemists like Ryan and look at molecules and be sure, where, can I leave a little functional group somewhere that I'm gonna be able to make this into a prodrug? I mean, it's that kind of thing. You know, I'm not a chemist, and my hat's off to those of you who can do that magic. But the, the, the message here is that in the future, if I want you, I, whoever in this room invents the next really good gram-negative drug, I want you to earn the $3 billion prize from the US government over 10 years. I want you to earn that. And you're gonna earn that because you, your molecule is really interesting. Now, everybody else along the way actually gets pulled up by you, because that's the reason why, why does the cancer area work? Why does the Alzheimer area work? Because there's a big prize. Only a few win, but there's a big prize. And that's what we're trying to do, is set it up so that there's lots of room for early work and lots of room for projects that fail, but get funded and you can do nice research. That's what we're trying to make possible. It's the ecosystem that runs over years. Ryan. mechanism. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and I, I, my preference would be we just sell that really amazing drug at a really high price because that's how cancer works. And when I have to explain to venture capitalists how this is going to work, they're like, I get that. And I explain the other one, they're like, we don't like it. But eventually, over enough time, I'm hoping changing the model will, it'll take time, though, I think, to get investors to accept it. Um, but my main comment was on, just because I think specific examples are super helpful. Um, and, and it relates to this panel, which is, so three years ago, which really feels like one normal non-epidemiological year ago, I was running a $2 million sponsored research budget at Acadian. We actually sponsored research at University of Work, too. Uh, I had a postdoc there working on the clavulani biosynthetic pathway. Um, so we would take long-term views, uh, let the postdocs work on work they could publish, but it was adjacent to things we were really interested in, so we could get our pipeline moving. Three years later, I'm starting over again. We have no sponsored research. Well, why? Because I can't raise enough money to do it on fair terms. And so that's effectively, and why can't I do that? 
because investors aren't valuing the antibiotic companies high enough to let us raise enough capital, and so, and so on and so on. So two specific examples, literally, for me, one year ago, I was doing $2 million a year of postdoc-sponsored work. This time around, zero. I think governments can play a real role. So for example, I'm not going to name the company, but we have a company that's basically an anti-cancer company, but they've taken a, their board has taken a decision that they're going to run in parallel an anti-infective discovery pipeline as well recognizing there'll be some revenue in the future, hopefully from the cancer you know, uh, developments. So I would really hope governments could look at companies like that and say, actually, you can have, if you're going to do this, you can have a significant tax break if you're going to take this on and, and, and then help train. And, and so I'm just going to point to you know, Hector, who's an you know, early career researcher. He's a joint industry fellow between Warwick and this company. Uh, and you know, you know, that's the next generation. So if there's tax breaks to enable companies to do that, it's not going to cost a lot of money because uh, it'll be a big tax break on revenue. They're bringing in just a bit less from the government. But, uh, you know, I, I think things like that it needs to be new ways of helping that innovation, academic engagement, SME engagement as well, to work with companies that have actually got some revenue. Uh, so anyway, anyway, I think AMR, antibacterial discovery by itself, is a really hard and almost impossible thing. It has to be lumped as an anti-infective or even with other things. To be honest, drug resistance in cancer is a problem. You know, multi, you talked about you know multi multi therapeutics, multi targeting. All the stuff I do is multi targeting. You know, one drug multi targets. You know, this is the same problem. You know, you know, and so uh, you know, I was trying to persuade Warwick to have a, a centre for drug resistance where actually you put the cancer in, you put the antifungal in, you put the antiparasites in, and you know, and, and seventy percent of it is all the same. But you have different front end and different back end, and, and that's really what I'd like to try and see happening worldwide somehow. Um, are there any more questions? If not, um, I think it was a very fruitful discussion. Uh, of course, we couldn't expect to find any solution to the problem. It's much too complex. Um, so with this, uh, we are getting into the break. There will be a break until 10 past 3. You will find some coffee outside and can get up. <laughs> um, and then 10 minutes after 3, we'll meet again here for the second boot camp.